Again, I will want to, uh, I will acknowledge our university and community supporters. The University of Iowa's international programs and the University of Iowa's honors program uh, both contribute vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I'm also very grateful to the Stanley U of I Foundation support organization for their long-term financial support. And I want to thank today's special sponsors, the International Writing Program, the Ida Beam Distinguished Visiting Professorship Program and the Human Rights Center. Our programs are made possible by the financial support of these sponsors. So now I want to turn the podium over to Christopher Merrill, the celebrated poet, nonfiction writer, and journalist who directs the University of Iowa's International Writing Program. He will introduce Ms. Di Giovanni. Chris? Thank you. It is a distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Janine Di Giovanni, who is not only our Ida Beam Distinguished Visiting Professor, but also a graduate of the Writer's Workshop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Janine has had a long and distinguished career dating back to her coverage of the wars in Bosnia and the conflict in Kosovo. She went on to cover the war in Chechnya, and her, int her interest in covering war has indeed encapsulated her entire career. If I were to list all the places, all the conflict stones she's uh, reported on, you would uh, all fall into despair. <laughs> Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. Her travels have taken her throughout many countries in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, and since the Middle East Spring, she has foc on the Arab Spring, she has focused on the Middle East. Janine is the Middle East editor for Newsweek, and she is an editor for Vanity Fair and contributes to The Guardian, Vogue, and The New York Times. Her themes are always to write about the human costs of war and to work in conflict zones that the world's press has forgotten. Janine is the recipient of several prestigious awards and honors, including the National Magazine Award and two Amnesty International Awards. She won Britain's Granada Television Foreign Correspondent of the Year Award for her work in Chechnya, and she's written several books, most recently, The Morning They Came for Us, Dispatches from Syria, which will be available uh, for purchase and to have Janine sign after her presentation today. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Janine Di Giovanni. Thank you. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. I really am. Um, 31 years ago, when that terrible bombing happened in Beirut, I was a student here, um, a very idealistic young writer who wanted to go and write novels and um, teach at a university and have a literary life. But something happened to me when I left here. Um, a chance trip took me to Gaza and the West Bank, and there I went to the very first refugee camp I'd ever been in. Up until then, I, I had lived a pretty protected life. I mean, I read the New York Times and I, I tried to watch the news, but I had no idea that people could live under such injustice, uh, with such hu humiliation on a daily, um, uh, every day, uh, checkpoints, family members being taken away, prisons, torture, killing, their homes being destroyed. For me, that moment changed my life forever. Um, and all of my ambitions to write novels and to be like Raymond Carver or Flannery O'Connor <laughs> or other great Iowa graduates went out the window completely. Um, I, I'm not a very brave person. And this year, I was very lucky to win something called the Courage in Journalism Award. And I was very baffled when I got it because I don't think of myself as courageous at all. Um, I'm afraid of many things, spiders and the dark. And, um, but I think what I've done for the past 25 years is to go to places where people don't have a voice or where I feel they don't have a voice and try to tell their stories. I, um, I hate bullies. I've hated bullies from the time I was a little kid at Catholic school and there were always 
Um, there was always kids who were stronger and bigger and richer and blonder or better looking or whatever. And they would, you know, usually pick on someone who was smaller and weaker and, and beat them up. And one day um, I was walking home from school and a kid ripped up my brother's homework. And I was seven years old and I took my backpack and I threw it over his head and I broke his nose. <laughs> he was 14. Um, <laughs> And his mother called my mother and said, um, your daughter's a little, a wild animal. And my mother said she was doing what she thought was right. She was defending someone. So I sometimes don't always get it right. And in the conflicts I've covered, which starting with the West Bank and Gaza, I then moved on to Sarajevo, where Chris and I have both worked. And I lived inside the city during the siege um, until the war ended, which was the most heartbreaking thing I've ever done until I began covering Syria. Um, after that, I went to Africa, and I spent many, many years working in Africa, um, from the Rwandan genocide in 1994, Somalia, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, South Sudan, Kenya, Burundi, um, Zimbabwe, South Africa, it went on. Then I went to Afghanistan and Iraq, um, which to me, by that point, I was beginning to get a bit exhausted. And also the nature of reporting for journalists had changed. Um, a lot of American reporters covering Afghanistan and Iraq embedded with, with American troops, which is something I don't do. Um, because I, for me, war is about the human beings who are living through it. How they survive, how war destroys the, their society, how it breaks down all kinds of communities. And this is what, um, always fascinated me. I am not an adrenaline freak. I'm, some of my colleagues are. I don't enjoy being shot at. I'm, you know, as I said, I'm afraid of most things. But I do feel that the people who are generous enough to give me their stories trust me to take it to people like you. So um, that's a little bit of my background. I, um, I live in Paris now. And of course, being in the middle of Europe, we are in the midst of uh, one of the worst refugee crises since World War II. Unlike that time, there seems to be very little compassion from my country, from, and I am American, but I'm also French by nationality, so I say both countries, I think. Um, Britain, the only country to me that's really stepped up is Germany. Um, who've taken on, um, um, Angela Merkel has really proved herself to be a great leader, I think, and the Scandinavian countries, as always. Um, but really, if we're going to talk about refugees, we've got to talk about why they're coming. <laughs> because I spent one year working for the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, on the Syria refugee crisis. Um, I was based in, in Lebanon, um, but I also worked in Turkey, uh, Jordan, uh, Iraq and Egypt. Now, of course, people, um, most of the people I worked with had to flee on foot. Uh, so the closest border to Syria is Turkey and, and, um, and Lebanon. Um, those who had a bit more money could fly and then they could get possibly to Egypt or Iraq. Um, very few made it to the US. Um, but really, why were they fleeing? It really drives me crazy when I'm in France or the U.S. and someone says, why do these people want to come here? They want our health care system and they want, you know, they want our jobs. I have never once met a refugee in the 20, how many years? 25 years since Bosnia, which was another massive refugee crisis, or African wars that I've covered. I've never met one refugee who wanted to leave their home. Every single one of them has been driven from their homes by war, by ethnic cleansing, by mass rape, by fear that their neighbors are going to butcher them. So I think what I really want to try to get across today, and I hope every one of you take it away, is that you know we need collective compassion. Um, because genuinely, especially with the way the elections might go, um, which is a bit worrying, the elections here, um, I think that we have to realize that all of these people what it takes to leave your home, it means you're completely uprooting your, your past. It means you're erasing your history. 
One of the most moving and disturbing things I've ever seen in my life was in a, um, a village in central Bosnia, right after the Bosnian Serb paramilitaries had ethnically cleansed it. Now, I hate that word. It's a horrible word, a horrible phrase. But what it means is even more horrible. It means that you, you want to wipe people, not just them, but their culture, their history, their, their stories, their families, their communities, off the face of the earth. And I went into a house that was, it was a village, and when we arrived, you could still smell the smoke. So they had just cleared it out, and the, the, the paramilitaries had just left. Um, everything was freshly burnt. There were, there were dead bodies around. And in one house I went into, I saw a, um, a photograph. And it was a photograph, a normal photograph, of a family on vacation at the seaside in Yugoslavia. And it was a mother, a father, and two kids. And the soldiers who had come in had taken a pen or something sharp and scratched out their faces. I, I can't tell you how disturbing that was, because they didn't destroy the photograph. They just took this photograph of a family and they scratched out their faces. So they no longer exist. And that, to me, is the plight of every refugee I've ever worked with. Um, it's a sense of identity, who we are. Um, aside from the immediate problems um, of education, of getting housing, of food, which is incredibly challenging, um, there's also this bigger existential question of who are we now? They're, they're not coming like my grandfather and my father came to America from Italy looking for a better life. Um, that, it's not the same thing. They're driven out. Um, they're uprooted violently. Um, and I just wonder how you ever heal from that. I did two specific projects working for UNHCR. Um, one was on children, and it was called The Future of Syria. And the other one was about women who were alone, which is something we don't really think of, but the fact is many of the refugees I met, um, the men were either killed or fighting. They were fighting back in Syria. So the women take the kids under their arm and, and flee. And um, once they got to their host countries, Lebanon, um, Jordan, they had to set up a whole new life for themselves. And these are women that lived, a lot of them were from very provincial. They weren't from Damascus City. They weren't educated. Many of them were illiterate. Many of them were farm women who had never been outside of their, their village or their province um, and their family unit. And, you know, women in that very, um, in the rural areas, are, are, they're not liberated women, let's just put it that way. So they could barely, um, they were in shock, first of all, when I would meet them. And then the really horrible thing was that they got, because they were alone, they got preyed on sexually by either locals or other people in the refugee camp who would just feel that they're alone, they're vulnerable. So that was really what I was working on. Um, and it was horribly disturbing because you would think that people so vulnerable would be protected, but they weren't. I also saw the, the weaknesses of the UN. Um, I had always believed that when people left their countries, you know, they were set up properly, but not in this case with Syrian refugees. They were literally given an emergency pack which had, um, you know, some uh, things to get them through a few days, toothbrushes and things like that. And then they were left alone. And there were so many cases I came across of, for instance, Palestinians who had been born and raised in Syria but were considered Palestinians from Yarmouk area of, of Damascus. And um, they couldn't register with UNHCR. They had to register with UNRWA, which is the Palestinian agency. And so with no money, they'd have to travel from northern Lebanon to Beirut, and then they'd get to Beirut and they'd be t turned away. And I. You know, as I spent this year working, you know, transitioning really from a journalist and a reporter who's worked with refugees and in war zones to, to a, a UN bureaucrat, um, I just had tremendous frustration. Uh, so shortly after that, I, I wrote my book about Syria. Um, it's not an easy book to read, but it's short. And I think it's a very good um, primer for what is happening there. 
I'm just going to read you a tiny excerpt, um, and then I would like to answer questions from you. Um, we could talk about the refugees in Europe, where they're going, what's, for instance, Calais camp in France, um, which is known as the jungle, is about to be disbanded. Uh, we could talk about the rise of right-wing parties in Europe, which is very frightening. Um, Hungary's Viktor Orban, um, France's Marine Le Pen, who will probably win the next election. Um, in Britain, the UKIP party. In Britain, the Brexit, mm -hmm. which, you know, took me, I've lived in Britain for many, many years, totally by surprise, as well as many other people. Um, we could talk about that. We could talk about solutions for Syria. Uh, we could talk about the humanitarian crisis. Um, one thing I do want to point out, I'm sure many of you, because you're international followers, this has been the worst two weeks ever in Syria. Um, the, the level of carnage has turned into something that even Ban Ki-moon, who is usually um, not very emotive, said it's worse than a slaughterhouse. Um, two million people are without water in Aleppo. There's 250,000 people trapped just in Aleppo. I'm not talking about Homs, Damascus suburbs, other places, Hama, Idlib. Um, there's 100,000 kids in Aleppo now. And one thing that I always think of, which brings it back home to me, I have a 12-year-old son. So six years ago when the war started, five and a half years ago, he was, he was seven. These kids in Syria have been out of school for five years. So that's an entire... That's from first to fifth grade. And I think of what my son learned in that time. He learned how to read. He learned how to make friends. He learned, and these kids don't. They haven't. Um, last week I was at the UN General Assembly and I met with Gordon Brown, um, the former Prime Minister of Britain. And he's now the UN Special Envoy on Education. And he believes that we must have emergency education immediately for refugees. And one of the things they're doing in Lebanon um, is split. The Lebanese government has been praised for their hosting of, of um, so many refugees, but to me, they haven't done enough. Um, and also, in the same way that they've welcomed Palestinians, um, and I say that with, with cynicism because Palestinians um, are still in the Sabra and Shatia camps. They can't get Lebanese citizenships because the Lebanese government says, well, we want them to go home. But what do these people have to go home to? Syria's in flames. It's been ripped apart by hatred. Um, talking earlier to Bill, I was asking about a transitional government there and what might happen. But we all know the lessons we learned from Bosnia and the aftermath of the Dayton Peace Accords, which ended the killing and effectively ended the war. But it froze the hatred. And... When I go back to Bosnia now, I am so disturbed by the level of resentment because in many ways the perpetrators of the crimes were rewarded with territory. The Serbs were winning when Dayton, um, when Dayton was signed and therefore they got the land that they, had, that they had fought for. I'm not sure what will happen in Syria. People ask me all the time. I imagine it will be a divided country which will have its own... Um, issues. But the most important thing to me is accountability. I really want these guys who are the same kind of bullies that I saw on the playground at school, but worse because they have more power, more money, more backing. I really want them held to accountability for the misery that they have inflicted on hundreds of thousands, mil I'm sorry, millions of people, millions of people. There are nine million people displaced in Syria. 4 million outside the country, 5 million inside. There's 400,000 dead, and that's a low figure, many of them children. I want these guys dragged to The Hague, and I want them to see justice. I want justice for every single person I've talked to in the past five and a half, six years, who have suffered, whose lives have been ripped apart, whose communities are destroyed. So I think, for me, the question is always about justice, so I'll read a little bit, and then I'm really looking forward to your questions. War means endless waiting, endless boredom, 
There's no electricity, so no television. You can't read. You can't see friends. You grow, depre you grow depressed, but there's no treatment for it, and it makes no sense to complain. Everyone is as badly off as you. It's hard to fall in love, or rather to stay in love. If you're a teenager, you're halted in time. If you're critically ill with cancer, for instance, there's no chemotherapy for you. If you can't leave the country for treatment, you stay and die slowly and in tremendous pain. Victorian diseases return, polio, typhoid, cholera. You see very sick people around you who seemed in perfectly good health when you last saw them during peacetime. You hear coughing all the time. As for your old world, it disappears, like the smoke from a cigarette you can't afford to buy anymore. Where are your closest friends? Some have left, others are dead. The few who remain have nothing new to talk about. You can't get to their houses because the road is blocked by checkpoints, or snipers take a shot when you leave your door, or you might go out on a wrong day and a barrel bomb dropped by a government helicopter lands near you. War looks like this, the steely grayness of the city, the clouds so low, but not low enough to hide government helicopters carrying bombs. What does war sound like? The whistling sound of the bombs falling that can only be heard before impact. Enough time to know you're too close, but not enough time to run. What does Aleppo smell like? It smells of carbine, wood smoke, unwashed bodies, rubbish rotting, and the heady smell of fear. The rubble on the street, the broken glass, the splintered wood that was once somebody's home. On every corner there's a destroyed building that may or may not still have bodies underneath, buried. Your old school is gone, your coffee house, your mosque, your church, your grandmother's house, and your office. Your memories are smashed. War is the empty shell casings on the street, the smoke from bombs rising up in mushroom clouds, and learning to determine which thud means what kind of bombs. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. War is the destruction, the skeleton, and the bare bones of someone else's life. I'm skipping a bit to my epilogue now. Sometimes in war, there's also pleasant memories. The camaraderie that exists, the intimacy between human beings, the fact that sometimes barriers are broken down, and a level of communication occurs that could never thrive in peacetime. People say things and do things that are profound and genuine. I remember a hot summer day in the old town of Damascus when a famous artist sat in his studio, a room in the former home of a Jewish family who used to keep their sacred Torah there, and he said the war was edging closer. He was neither pro-government or pro-opposition. Of course, he believed in democracy and freedom of expression, being an artist. But most of all, he just cared about creating art. In, 2000, in 2010, before the Arab Spring, he expressed his vision of the future of the Middle East in a sculpture exhibition called Guillotine. He opened it in downtown Damascus. Now, several years on, with hundreds of thousands dead, something has changed irrevocably in this country. It will not return to what it was, not now, not ever. How can Syria ever be what it once was? It's been burnt alive by hatred. Just one more page. <laughs> Shortly before I finished this book in the spring of 2015, after numerous trips back to the region, as ISIS spread past Mosul and reached Palmyra, I got an email from a group of reporters and photographers I had worked with in Sarajevo during the Bosnian War. They had put together a collection of photographs and writing, our memories, in a time module, a way of not letting anyone forget what happened to that defeated and broken country that was once Yugoslavia. <coughs> they had bundled our words and photographs and some haunting music together to make a 10-minute presentation that traced the war from beginning and end, from first nationalistic parades to the murders of innocents to the mass graves, the destruction of mosques, villages, and cities, and finally to the Dayton Agreement in 1995. It was our way of saying, look, this is how war begins and how it ends. Nothing good ever comes from it. I could not help watching the short film over and over, the way you pick at a wound that hurts. And the more you pick, the more painful and sore it grows, but you keep doing it. And every time I watched it, I cried. Tears rolled down my face and onto my t-shirt the way they had 
during a day in a hospital in Aleppo, which I write about before in the book. I felt ashamed of my reaction. After all, I'd survived. I hadn't been ethnically cleansed from my village or raped or my parents murdered in front of me, but most of all, what I felt was immense sorrow. We had tried, my colleagues, my diplomats, dedicated humanitarians, reporters, but we failed to protect the very people that we had come to report on, to stop the killing. Somehow, we could not stop this country from being ripped apart, limb from limb, throat, eye, knuckle bone. I swore to myself after Bosnia that I'd never live through another war that would consume me. I swore that I would not feel the terrible stirring of guilt so profound, the feeling that we did nothing. I wondered sometimes what my life would be if I had never stumbled into a war zone for the first time when I was a very young woman, so young that I was embarrassed to tell my age. How different my life would have been if I never saw a mass grave or a truck with bodies all dead piled one on top of each other, or torture cells with the incarcerated's dying wish and last words of love to his family. But that's not what happened. And perhaps as the political scientists I studied so diligently as a student, Charles Tilley, wrote, men are inevitably linked to war as a way of state making. Wars make states. Or is it the other way around? Do states make war? I've never been good at theory, but I'm very good at counting. And I attempting and attempting to rem remember those who lived, who walked the earth, but who fell during the course of the violence that ripped their countries apart. As I write this and read this, the Syrian war continues, and there are nearly 400,000 Syrians dead. The Book of the Dead is not yet finished. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Janine. I have one correction to make. Janine said she's not a courageous person, but I think this is <laughs> abundant evidence that this is one of the most courageous people on the planet. So, uh, the first question for you, Janine, is what does accountability look like for these perpetrators? And how can we, as Iowa City citizens, contribute to create the end of this war? Um, very good questions. First of all, what you can do, awareness. I'm really, I live in a bubble of Syria right now. So my life basically is about what happened in Aleppo overnight, how the doctors are getting medication in. Um, so I'm very uh, involved in this minutia of what's happening in the war. But I'm always really surprised at how little people know about it. And it's not your fault. I, when I look at the newspapers, it's sometimes it's, there's not even stories about, about um, Syria. Sometimes it's in, even in the New York Times, it's buried on the back pages. So the first thing I would ask you, really beg you to do, is to open up and be aware of, of what is happening there. The more you know, the more you can put pressure on politicians, whoever it might be. Um, but Iowa is a, is a liberal state. Iowa City is a liberal place. Um, you're caring people. And we're all part of humanity. Um, so if there ever is a chance to welcome refugees here, do so. Um, you know, if you have a chance to open, uh, on a big level, your home, I mean, I have friends in London that have opened their homes to, to people that have come. Um, but really, more to the point, awareness. And you know, I know probably a lot of you don't use Facebook or Twitter or things like that, but if you do, it, I use them not to take pictures of my cats, but to daily post stories about um, small things of what's happening in, in cities and in, in cities and villages in the countryside of Syria. So talk about it. Um, have meetings, gather together, see what you can do. There is tremendous power. In, in groups, in collectives. And I, I truly believe in, in people power. And Chris and I have talked a lot these past four days about friends of ours, kids in Belgrade, students who overthrew Slobodan Milosevic, the dictator, the butcher of the Balkans, one of the butcher of the Balkans. Um, he was a president for more than 30 years and they overthrew him. They were students at Belgrade University. So things are possible. Re I'm not saying revolu you want to have a revolution in Iowa City, but I'm saying that don't ever think you can't do anything because you can, um, just simply by being compassionate, caring, 
open, having knowledge of the situation. So that's my, um, that's my advice on that. Accountability. Accountability means that war crimes are recognized. Um, for instance, in Syria, one thing that I've thought I've seen everything, but one of the most horrific crimes against humanity that's taking place is um, starvation as a tool of war. So one of Assad's tactics has been to besiege cities or, or towns and basically until people would surrender to starve them. And sometimes you'll see outside of, of certain towns like Darea, they, they actually write um, surrender or starve. And I find this, you know, people say education is the most fundamental right and it's, it's, a, it's a, um, a crime against humanity to deprive people of education, but to deprive people of food because they don't want to surrender to a regime is horrific. And sometimes um, I have some friends in, De in Aleppo and Darea all over, but I have a, a, a friend in Darea, which was a city that was besieged for three and a half years and fell to Assad's forces two weeks ago. Um, but I would write to my friend and say, what did you eat today? Um, and he'd say, some grape leaves, some salt, um, we made some soup out of grass. Um, you know, a good day might mean getting some rice. I mean, this is, this is a country that's, you know, three hours, if I could fly there, from Paris. Um, so that's a crime against humanity. Um, sexual violence during wartime, you know, rape used as a tool of war. Um, I don't know if any of you ever had a chance to see Angelina Jolie's extraordinary film called In the Land of Blood and Honey. Um, it's, it's about Bosnia and it's about the rape camps of Bosnia. And if you see that, what you, what you realize, if you didn't know, is that rape, especially in wartime, is never about young, beautiful girls. It's about humiliation and destroying communities so that um, women can't marry, especially if they're Muslim, if they've been raped. Um, older women are raped. Um, senior citizens are raped. It's just a way of completely destroying a society, humiliating the men because they can't protect them. This is something, um, again, you know, people like um, William Hague, the former Prime Minister of Britain, it seems that Britain does quite a lot with, with these things, but there's a great awareness, I think, of, of um, humanitarian issues there. Um, to try to, again, awareness, build awareness, and to me, awareness is the greatest thing. I mean, people like me are documenting um, war crimes. You know, as I go along, what I'm doing really, I'm less of a journalist and much more of a researcher, and I'm keeping track of everything. Um, people's, if you if you read my book, um, there's a lot of documentation of um, people, what happened to people. So I keep all that, and you know I will go to the Hague or I will go to a war crimes tribunal wherever it is set up and and give testimony of it, um, and then hopefully the perpetrators of this madness will be brought to trial. Um, it doesn't, I have to say something grim, which is that it doesn't always happen because in Bosnia, Milosevic had a heart attack and escaped getting justice. Karadzic, who was the, um, the leader of the Bosnian Serbs, is in custody now. But many of the people that, the actual rapists and the people that burnt the houses and the people that killed um, are not there. They're still wandering around in their villages. And I have friends who, who were raped at that time, and they have to see these guys every day. And the women are the ones who have to drop their heads in shame and not the other way around. So I, I want to live in a world where you cannot commit such evil. And if you do, you are held to accountability. I hope that answered it. Some of you may remember those uh, Serbian students came to visit here about 10, 12 years ago. They, they were still quite young and doing amazing work. Oh, poor. They came. Oh, poor. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Will the pursuit of justice for Assad et al. have the practical effect of perpetuating the violence? Can you make the case that to end the barbar barbarism, you have to leave Assad in place? <coughs> You know, I, I wrote an op-ed about this um, about six months ago for The Guardian, and I, 
I said that I felt perhaps um, there, there might be considered that he stays during the transitional period because the chaos that would ensue afterwards, and especially is ISIS going to end up in Damascus? Wow, I, you know, I wrote it not, it's really, it's not really what I believe completely because I do think a monster like that with blood on his hands cannot rule a country. But what I meant was during the, the transitional period leading up to the elections that he could step away in an elegant way, which is the only way we're going to get rid of him now unless he's assassinated. Um, he had his chance to leave, you know, to go to Russia or to go. There were other countries that wanted to take him. He refused. Um, I don't, my personal view is I don't think he's, he's going to willingly go. I've radically changed my view, which is that um, I think that there can be no peace and no reconciliation with him in Damascus. It, it cannot. Um, he, from the very beginning, he fired upon his people. And we have to remember that the, the Syrian war started out as the Syrian revolution, which was a nonviolent revolution wanting to end a 40-year reign of, of a dictator. It's just people who want it something we take for granted every single day, democracy. Um, and they paid the heaviest price, the heaviest price. And as their country spiraled into civil war, it was hijacked by jihadists. Um, so, and Assad has very cleverly used this, as, as well as Putin, as a way of saying, you know, we, we don't want these guys running the country, you would rather have us. So I think it's a smokescreen. So simple answer, no, he cannot be, um, with any kind of accountability, he cannot stay. You noted that the Dayton Accords ended the Bosnian War but froze the hate. What might negotiators have done differently to break down the hate, which might have been acceptable to both sides, and how might that be applied to the conflict in Syria? <clears throat> The Dayton Peace Accords, it's very interesting to study um, how the chief negotiator, Richard Holbrook, worked. Um, he, first of all, the difference between Dayton and Sy the Syrian negotiations going on now, led by Stefan de Mistura, the UN Special Envoy, is that Holbrook had the backing of the greatest military machine on earth, the United States. He had, he was there with a mandate to end the war, but he had airstrikes at his disposal. Um, so he could use that as leverage with Milosevic. Um, de Mistura does not. What de Mistura is doing now is trying to get with, with John Kerry and, and his, count, his Russian counterpart Lavrov are trying to do is to convince Assad to go. But in fact, it's so wrought with complications because it is now turned into a gigantic proxy war so on one side, on the opposition side, you basically have Turkey, Qatar, the U.S., Saudi, um, Turkey, Qatar, the U.S., Saudi, Kuwait to some extent, Egypt to some extent. And on the other side, you have Russia, Assad, backing Assad is Russia, um, China to a lesser extent, and Iran, Hezbollah fighters. So what Dimistura spends all his time doing basically is trying to get them to the table just to get these guys to sit in Geneva and actually talk to each other. And it, the talks have broken down so many times that they haven't even gotten to the point where they're discussing maps and um, where the displacement of people. It's just simply, I mean, the, what they're working towards is tiny ceasefires in Aleppo. Um, or, you know, they tried to have a nationwide ceasefire two weeks ago, which, um, the, the day after that, Assad walked through Daraya, Dar which had just fallen, and basically said, um, this country will return to state freedom, meaning totalitarianism. Um, so how could the war end without ending the hatred? I'm, I'm not sure it can, although Rwanda is one country that where there has been great healing, um, and they have managed, not that it's been forgotten, the genocide, because I don't think you can ever forget these things. But they have managed to implement policies that have, that have made the transitional period more nimble, I think, 
would be the word, and also um, things like their parliament has more women than any other parliament in the world. Um, and also within their constitution, you're not even allowed to say Hutu or Tutsi. So I think that in some ways um, to generate healing, first we have to end the war. And I'm, I'm not quite sure how that will happen because traditionally wars end when soldiers are exhausted. But these guys keep getting funded by outside sources. So the more money we pour into them, the more money Russia pours into them, the more airstrikes Russia launches, um, the more they're breeding extremism. So they don't seem to understand that with every bomb they drop on an Aleppo hospital, they're recruiting more people to ISIS. A couple of process questions. For the many journalists that chose to work in camp within the U.S. military, embeds, how, does that, how did that affect their in the integrity of their reporting and what we read? And on the other side of it, what's the best way to listen to a refugee tell their story or any person with a very sad and disturbing story to tell? So let's start with reporting, um, with working with refugees. I think you just listen. You know, I, I don't think there's any skill to knowing how to um, talk to people. I think you just listen. Because these people have really been, their voices have been cut. You know, they have no one to talk to. They have no one to complain to. I was thinking that it, um, one project that an Italian NGO did in northern Lebanon with Syrian refugee women, which sounds so small, but it, I cannot tell you how successful it was. They had a, um, a knitting circle. And it was literally just a room where these women would come every Tuesday morning with their knitting because they, um, they, were, they were trying, or crocheting, they were trying to make things that they could sell, like baby clothes. And, but what it really was, was a group therapy session. And they sat around the circle and they crocheted like they did back home and they talked to each other. And it was just a way of saying, you know, I have no way to get my daughter to the hospital. Who, my daughter's in a wheelchair and I can't get her to the hospital because I'm living in a place with muddy... Just talking. Um, and, you know, I, I've studied a lot um, about working with people with deep trauma. And my... I mean, my the way that I do it, my... I don't want to say technique because I just don't think of myself as a technician or that journalism or writing is a process. To me, it's just something very organic. Um, I sit on the floor for a long time with people, and I drink a lot of tea, <laughs> and, um, and I smoke cigarettes, which I don't normally do in my real life, but you know, sometimes they smoke and they want you to smoke with them. So, um, and I just listen to them, and I say very little. And I think that it just gives them the chance to, to talk. And it, it also takes, I have a great luxury in that um, I don't work for newspapers anymore where you have a deadline of, you know, the next minute. So I can spend a lot of time with people. And that, um, that's very, very rewarding. And I feel very privileged to be able to do that. Um, first question about embedding journalists. Well. I can see the point of why newspapers, you know, the Washington Post or the New York Times like to have reporters do that. And I think it was very important in terms of safety because um, take the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, some of those places would, would be impossible for journalists to reach unless they were with soldiers. Um, having said that, personally, it's not my thing because I want to talk to people in the villages. I want to talk to the, the Afghan people and the Iraqi people. I don't want to talk to American soldiers, as worthy as they are. And, and you know, I'm not in any way um, insulting the, the military. They do a fantastic job. But I'm not really interested in guns and um, military strategies. I mean, I need to know about it, of course, to, to have the bigger picture. But, I mean, I was thinking about one time when I I did embed once in Afghanistan, um, in Helmand province, in a, a base that was called Sangin, which is, was the bloodiest um, base in, in all of Afghanistan, because um, the, the local insurgency planted landmines everywhere. And um, every morning I'd go out on patrol with these soldiers who were, you know, 18, 19 years old, really young. But I always wanted to wander off the path that they were walking on while they were on patrol and, and talk to the guy in the bazaar. And they wouldn't let me, of course. They were like, no, he could be booby-trapped, he could be... Um, 
And it just, it, it set up such a division between the, me with the British soldiers in the base and the world out there. And they were trying to tell me that, you know, these guys in the villages are not good guys. They're all reporting back on us and, and planting bombs and doing all this stuff. But I, I felt I, I was only getting half the story. So in some cases, I think embedding could be useful, but it's just not my thing. I can also say, if you read her book, you'll see a great example of how to listen to refugee stories and tell them. As students in a public privileged university, it's often hard to either uh, find ways to help people in such circumstances or to convince others that these global conflicts must be addressed not only from a political perspective, but from a humanitarian one. As people who often feel overlooked in the sphere of power, what advice and recommendations can you give us to facilitate a change? Um, I'm not a professional activist. So, I mean, people often ask me this, and I'm not like a change.org person that um, knows how to actually, w my role is really to, to bring awareness. Um, so that's, I would strive that to you. But actually on the ground doing something, I mean, I always say, to, to young journalism students, you don't need to go to war to, to find human stories. I mean, there are extraordinary stories everywhere. There's people that are fighting their own battles in, in many different ways. But very specifically answering your, your query, what could you do in a, in a privileged place in the middle of America? Um, I think, again, awareness. I mean, I think you have to have marches, have um, demonstrations, have, I mean, back to the kind of 60s, um, you know, uh, raising consciousness. Because not enough people know about it. I mean, I was really shocked in a journalism class I was in yesterday, and these are people studying to be journalists, that how little they knew about the war in Syria. Um, so I think that if those are students studying journalism, and they're not aware of that, you, you really have a job to do here. Um, I'm staying at Iowa House, and I was coming down, and there was a, a, a notice about the TPP, um, and there's going to be demonstrations, and I was thinking, God, this is so great. You know, I love when people come together and protest stuff. <laughs> and um, you, it has a knock-on effect. It genuinely does, even if, I mean, I always feel that if I give a talk like this, and I come away, and there's two or three people that take what I say to heart, and do something about it, and, and transform their anger and their indignation or their passion into action, then, then I've done a good job. I don't think I'm going to get the entire world to listen to me. But I think that two or three people tell two or three other people, and they tell two or three other people, and that's how change happens. I mean, we got Obama elected with change.org. So, you know, I think people power is very, is very strong. So make sure you register to vote. Yes. <laughs> so one, one, one last question. Um, how do you keep going? <laughs> um, I, you know, I feel very privileged. I don't feel um, depressed or exhausted or I feel, I mean, of course, I do get really tired, but I, um, I feel so, so privileged that these people allow me to tell their stories. And I feel that I um, I'm able to go to these places and you know it goes back to really the my mentor the first woman that got me doing this who said if you have the ability to go to these places and tell these stories then you have an obligation and um, you know after all these years I never did write a novel and you know often I feel very guilty about it but <laughs> I, I did something else you know and I don't think I would have been happy sitting in my little room writing things inside my head um, I I keep going because of all of the people I meet every day who inspire me. And these people inspire me tremendously. Um, so I'm the lucky one. And, and also, I'm the one that gets to get on the plane and, and go home. They don't. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of guilt with that. But I, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a lucky person. And, and I also, you know, I always say this, but every time I take a shower, I promise, I just think, water. And, and that, comes from, that comes from living in Sarajevo, where we had no water. And we had like one glass a day 
of bottled water that we used to do everything, to wash, to brush our teeth, to drink, to take our vitamins. That was it. And from that day on, I have never, ever taken for granted water, electricity, health care. Um, every hospital I go into in Syria that doesn't have anesthetic or where a baby dies because of a respiratory illness that could be treated in any urgent walk-in clinic in America, I feel like the luckiest person in the world. So I'm inspired and I keep going by the people I meet. I know that Bill is going to formally close the session, but in addition to thanking Janine, I also want to say that her book makes very clear that truth is stranger and often more vivid even than fiction. So buy copies. And I'll sign it for you. <laughs> yeah, th thanks also, Chris, for fielding the questions. Um, uh, we've been very fortunate today uh, to have this presentation. Uh, on behalf of the Iowa City Relations Council, uh, I do want to thank Janine DiGiovanni. And uh, let me thank our sponsors once more, the University of Iowa International Programs, the <laughs> University of Iowa's Honors Program, the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization. Uh, we're, all, we're grateful for all their generous support. And thank you also to today's special sponsors, the International Writing Program, the Ida Cordelia Beam Distinguished Visiting Lecture Professor Program, and the U of I's Human Rights Center. Thanks also to City Channel 4. Now, Janine, as a small token of our appreciation, uh, I am very happy to be able to present you with what we like to call the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We are adjourned. Thank you.